Welcome everybody to Bodhisattva training for contemporary life with our teacher, Stefan Pende. Yeah, we will continue where we finished yesterday. So we are in the section of the 37 practices uh, about uh, Lojong, which can be translated as attitude training, or it's also sometimes called transforming problems. And Tongmi Sampo goes through six different scenarios, which we all know from our life. So they had the same challenges as us. And yesterday, we, uh, the scenario was uh, being stolen from. Uh, so on today, I think we will cover two verses. And in one of them, it's about injustice, you know, being accused or attacked uh, without any reason. And the second is uh, slandering, be, to be slandered about. You know, rumors are spread are about us. We are, we are losing our reputation, which I think uh, in the times of the internet can easily, easily and quickly happen. You know, that there's rumors are spread and you can't do anything about it. So these are the, the two scenarios. And the practice being suggested in this text to work with these experiences is the practice of Tonglen, which uh, Tongle Sangpo covers in the previous verse. So Tonglen, the giving and taking, meaning uh, taking in the, the unwanted, taking, taking in the painful and giving what is needed, giving relief, sharing your resources. So this uh, invitation to reverse our natural attitude towards situation, our natural attitude is wanting to have the good for ourselves and trying to get rid of the bad. So this is reversed. So the practice of Tonglen undermines uh, the self-centeredness of the narrative self. But it is challenging because it is counter-instinctual. It's not, not our automatic response. So the practice of Lojong is based on an understanding of emptiness. It's based on seeing that what is happening in our life does not have meaning from its own sight. That's not only a Buddhist insight. You know, there is this Greek philosopher Epicur who said, it's not about what is happening in your life, it's about how you relate to it. And that's what we're exploring in the practice of Lojong. How can we relate to what is happening in our life in a way that it facilitates our growth, or our wisdom, our kindness, our love, our freedom? It's actually a very precious teaching because when we have understood that life will remain to be difficult, that life is full of problems and that we will experience these different kinds of scenarios again and again and again. There's no way to avoid them or uh, try to come to a place of life which is just swell and, and without challenges. So since these things are happening and they are unavoidable, as a Bodhisattva baby, we ask ourselves, so yeah, this is happening. So how can I relate to what is happening in a way that they become meaningful for my development, for my learning, for my growing, for my healing? So we will start, uh, as always, with a little meditation. And I want to bring, like yesterday, a quote uh, from the commentary of Ken McCloyd. Uh, it's repeating a point I also, or an instruction uh, uh, I shared yesterday. With every breath, 
go to the edge of what you can feel and still be present and aware of where you are, what you're experiencing and what you are doing. So with every breath, go to the edge of what you can feel. So, and that is a capacity we, we explore in meditation. We are going to the edge of what is happening right now without, uh, without being, without letting us overwhelmed from the content of our experience. So it is a bit uh, paradoxical, this gesture. So in one way you become more intimate with what is happening in the present moment. And in, a, in another way, it bothers you less. Can, can Wilbur puts it like this, it, it hurts you more, but it bothers you less. So it hurts you more because of course, if you become more intimate with your feelings, you feel them deeper. You, 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 uh, you can afford to feel them deeper because there is also that space. So you inhabit more the witnessing than you inhabit the content of your experience. And uh, so that's, the, that's like the edge uh, Ken McLeod is uh, pointing to here. And what the edge is, is, is of course different for all of us and it's different in different scenarios. So sometimes the content of our experience is so difficult that we, that we need to really go slow and for short moments maybe. And maybe sometimes we even need to take the hand of another person or you know, call a guardian angel or Tara so that we are able to be with our experience and in the same time as he says here we 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 are we can you can be still still be present and aware of where you are what you experience and what you're doing so you are more yeah so it's like you could compare it a little with a stream, so there is a stream, the stream of our experience, and we are either in the stream and being swept away by the stream, or in meditation, we step to the riverbank. Uh, and we step to the riverbank, not with the intention to disconnect, to transcend, or not to feel what we feel, but we actually step to the riverbank to feel more, to be able to feel more. So this is one possible trap we can fall into in meditation practice, that we're using our meditation practice to disconnect from our experience, to, to kind of bypass uh, uh, the, the difficult, uh, not, not to feel. So th that is a possible misunderstanding of meditation and. Yeah. Buddhist practice is about going towards human experience and going through it uh, and, uh, and not passing, passing it. So let's uh, take our seat together in our virtual temple. Just in your posture and then softening. If you like, you can close your eyes. Allowing the shift from the doing to being from the head into the body. starting with your with the whole posture down to your feet and your legs and the surface you're sitting on and 
as best as you can, welcoming the different guests in the guest house of the body. And it's a very natural and gentle process of sliding or dropping into the trunk of your body with awareness and breath. And uh, let's uh, appreciate that we are doing this together. We are allowing this process together. So by meeting our inner life, we also meeting shared, shared and common humanity. And then in the out breath, there's a possibility of some softening, some off, some opening, almost like sighting putting down a bit of the burden, the burden of control and burden of trying to get somewhere. Unhook from thinking. So emphasizing the inner dialogue and the mental image less. And instead dropping back, sliding into the felt sense of your body, the aliveness in your body. Maybe there's something in the foreground, either pleasant or unpleasant. So you allow that to be and just breathing with as if the breath and awareness becomes an embrace, holding softly, touching gently. Um, being at the edge means uh, that you become more intimate and closer to your experience. And at the same time, you stay grounded and in connection with, with in, connect, in connection with being the witness, witnessing. And with the out breath, we can relax the grasping in case there's the attempt to get rid of something or get something, then we relax that grasping, just being present.
then in our virtual temple, we call upon the presence of the Buddha, Soul in Dalai Lama, Lama Sopa, or whoever is your mentors, your guardians, your role models. So we fill the space of our awareness with kindness, with essence love, with light, with a loving space. And then after a while, you know, giving your inner life the space it needs, something might open up more. Spaciousness becomes a little more available. You are with and notice and are intimate with the movements of the sensations in your body, emotional movements. But you also sense presence. Space. If you notice that you get entangled again in the inner dialogue or the mental images, sliding back towards present moment awareness, towards the felt sense of your body. And you don't need to label the energy. You don't need to go into stories. Just experiencing what is. Even the word mine or myself, I recognize as just thoughts. Sometimes in a quiet moment like that, there can be a wonderment, 
of that you are present, that you are happening, that there is experience, that there is breathing, that there is awareness. You are alive. And whatever arises for you, you allow that to move wherever it wants to move. Making a backward step into witnessing, lovingly witnessing, or kindly witnessing, or at least neutral witnessing. So you start to inhabit more spacious awareness. You start to inhabit the mystery of witnessing. Without disconnecting from the content. And this uh, loving, <clears throat> loving presence, loving witnessing, or kind witnessing, uh, happens without any agenda. So we are not doing it to change our experience. We just witness and trust the process. without hopes. The loving gaze. making the backward step until there's nothing anymore to step back into. And then resting, inhabiting, witnessing. Inhabiting presence. And sometimes something opens up, a stillness, a peace.
and then we rest there. And at one point, we might become even curious about the witnessing itself. What is that which is witnessing? And when we do that, we start to realize that there's nobody there. The witnessing is not coming from a separate solid I. It's coming from everywhere and nowhere. It's a mystery. And with the in-breath, we can move closer, like in the practice of Tonglen. We in the, with the in-breath, we move into the experience as it is. And then with the out-breath, out breath, we can emphasize space, presence, boundaryless, centerless. So try to get a sense of the edge, the moving content. And it's probably not very challenging right now. Maybe it is, depending on what you brought with you into the session. But it could be also rather peaceful and slow, the content. But still, there is that edge between witnessing and content. The witnessing is not separate from the content, it pervades the content, but it is bigger than the content. So, and then you take your time to open your eyes if they are closed, 
making the visual field part of your experience. Maybe with a sense that you're looking from a different place, like more with your body. So sometimes when we meet our inner life like that. When we come then out of the meditation and we open our eyes, it could be that we actually also perceive our surroundings in a different way. Somewhat more vibrant or Magical. With a bit more wonderment. So let's start with the text. If you have questions, you can interrupt me. We are not so many either on the chat or you just unmute yourself. So we are in first 13. Even if you have done nothing wrong at all, and someone still tries to take your head off, spurred by compassion, Take all his or her venom into you. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. So even if you have done nothing wrong at all, yeah. now, um, the, the opportunity here in these uh, scenarios is, or the invitation is to uh, kind of make a, a story around it for yourself. You know, remember or imagine a situation like this. Uh, so even if you have done nothing wrong at all, so you know how does that feel? And it's it's also interesting to uh, to check up on the age of that part of you who feels like. Oh, I have nothing. I have done nothing wrong at all. I'm so I'm so innocent. How can? Why is life? Un, why does this injustice happens to me? Injustice shouldn't happen. It's wrong. So how how old is that part? Who feels like that? You know, still somehow hoping to live in a world full of justice. But I think we all can connect with that, that cry inside. I have done nothing wrong. I'm innocent. This shouldn't happen, it's injustice. And injustice is wrong. It's the other people. And how old is that part? Someone still tries to take your head off. Yeah, so what, what kind of situations come into your mind with that? Someone tries to take your head off, you know, probably at work, or being accused, being fired. You 
Have you had recent experiences of being accused? Being the scapegoat? And then spurred by compassion. Yeah, so that's you know, connecting with your heart. Take all his or her venom into you. So the, the, the practice here has kind of different directions. So first we start with how we feel about the situation. So we pause and explore our own feelings, our own reactivity, a bit like we did now in our meditation. Yeah, so going to the edge, how, how deep can I feel this without being overwhelmed? And uh, then there's like supportive practices, uh, which helps us to do it. Uh, the meditation posture, for example, our refuge, taking bodhicitta, calling, calling upon the guru, calling upon Tara, but also other things like making yourself a cup of tea or going for a walk, doing some yoga. Yeah, so the, the practice of uh, being able to feel all your feelings uh, needs to start with connecting with the resor resources which makes it possible for you to do that. So what, and a lot of our traditional practices in Tibetan Buddhism, they, they are about connecting us with resource resources, you know, taking refuge, that's taking refuge, bodhicitta, the body, you know, grounding practices, breathing practices, moving practices, prostrations, you know, making offerings. So all these practice, they, they, all the so-called preliminary practice, they then, and then there is actually also in tantric practice, you have the protector practices. So, you call upon uh, the protectors. Yeah. And obviously through all these practices, we connect with uh, resources within us. So it's not that we think that we call an angel from outside who is going to help us. So the, the calling upon the angel is a stepping stone to connect with the angel inside of you. So that's where we start. And with that, we interrupt uh, the pattern of reactivity. We create some space so that we are able to respond from a different place. And then a possible next step could be that uh, we start like yesterday in the example with the thief and Dipama. So we start to bring our awareness to the person. And we uh, feel their pain. Uh, we feel their struggle like a boss who is taking your head off, is not happy. And um, we kind of walk a little bit in his or her shoes. In we start to realize that Sometimes we are the victim, and sometimes we are the one who's doing it. We start to understand, hey, that's not someone out there. It's actually showing 
a pattern to me, which is also in me. We start to understand that violent behavior is coming from pain and is creating pain. So you also include into your compassion uh, to the, towards the other person, the fact that this person creates causes for suffering. And then with the in-breath, if you do it as a Tom Lan practice, you breathe that in. So that's what Tong Le Sanpo calls here, take all his or her venom into you. And again, you go to the edge, to, to that place where you can still hold the experience. So the next uh, possible direction then is to open our awareness to all the people right now who have a similar experience and all the people who, who, who take the head off of other people. So we, we, we're using or well, we, we are we're taking a, a particular situation as a stepping stone to open our awareness, say, this is actually not personal. It's not just happening to me. So we connect with all the people who, whose head is taken off right now. And we, uh, we can do that because the situation shows us how it feels. But also we, are, we, we uh, open our heart uh, so to the victim, vic victims, but also to the, what's the word for it? Predator, predator maybe, or uh, something, the person who's doing it. So we breathe that in and you're know, using a Tonglen visualization, a Tonglen practice. And then we breathe out for ourselves, for the particular situation and for that person who, is, who took your head off, who abused you, who crossed your boundaries. And then we open that circle. So at the end of this process, um, you are in a different place then. So And that different place then can be the place from where you act, where you say something. So the, the, this practice is not meant to make us like doormats and just uh, you know, allow other people to take our head off or to be quiet when there's injustice in the world. Uh, but our response to un the injustice in the world and our response to this situation comes from a very different place than our reactivity. So we are actually able to contribute to the situation instead of being part of the circle of violence. So you took my head off. So now I wish you that someone would take your head off or I have to do it myself and I'm justified to do it because you did that to me. So that is the spiral of violence. 
where you actually can't say who was the victim in the first place. This is violence responding to violence, responding to violence, and it just goes on like that. So Ken McLeod writes, you can know what to do only when you are no longer disturbed by your emotional reactions and you are free from the confusion of the conceptual mind. You, you can know what to do only when you are no longer disturbed by your emotional reactions. So in, uh, we come to a place where we give up the project to figure the situation out conceptually. And we, in that space, which then opens, there is an intuition. The intuition can come forth. What, what's, what's the most beneficial way to say, to do right now? So our response to the to this situation becomes much more creative, much more kind, and can be more aligned with our deepest values. But the challenge here is, in order to come to that place, we need to feel the pain. And there's an instinct in us of not wanting to do that. So we are, our reactivity to the situation, like uh, responding with violence to violence, is our attempt not to feel the pain in the situation. That makes it so difficult. Our phobia towards difficult feelings, towards feeling our reactivity, to feel our phobia towards feeling our vulnerability, our helplessness, our despair, our grief, our fear of death. our phobia towards that. Because we have not trained in our life, or we have not learned that our feelings are not dangerous. We don't trust that. We feel that feelings are dangerous, poisoning. And sometimes they are even called mental poison, poison. It's a really stupid word to call feelings mental poisons. It's just feelings, they are not poisoning. Our relationship to them is poisoning. So you take this first and you uh, you uh, fill it with a story or an experience or a memory, or that's why we read this first again and again, so that as soon as something like this happens to us, a kind of mindfulness bell rings. Ah, yeah, that's the, that's exactly now is happening to me what Tom Sampo described. Great, let's, let's try, let's try it out, yeah? Let's, let's see. And then of course, failing and failing and, uh, and uh, but then over time, you might uh, notice a change yeah? that uh, your automatic response of uh, someone taking your head off, is not uh, to take your sword out and try to cut off the head of the other person, but to, uh, to explore another approach, a bodhisattva approach. So 
So let's move to first 14. So the, like the, 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 the process is the same in these six scenarios. Yeah? So it's what I described. And uh, also, if you read the commentary of Ken McLeod, then uh, he describes this, uh, how to bring the attitude of Tom Len into scenarios like this. And it's, it's really worthwhile to read uh, also the commentary again and again. Yeah? So that, you know, as a reminder, also to fire our intention and our commitment to actually apply these teachings, to actually use this, uh, uh, this approach. So first 14. Even if someone broadcast to the whole universe slanderous and ugly rumors about you, even if someone broadcasts to the whole universe, I mean, back then it was just possible to broadcast in the valley, you know, but for us, it is actually true. You know, rumors are broadcast to the whole world, yeah. And it can, it can so easily happen. And people, you know, I mean, people kill themselves because they can't stand that rumors are broadcast into the whole world. Even if someone broadcasts to the whole universe slanderous and ugly rumors about you, again and again, with an open and caring heart, praise his or her abilities. Yeah. So the, the, the first step is the feeling your feelings, the rage, the helplessness, the frustration. And uh, in our times in the internet, you can't stop it anymore. It's out there. And even if it's a complete lie, it will do something with people. And you know that. And even if you know with whom it started, you one can't do anything about it. So, these this, this feelings, uh, they are very difficult. So what this, uh, this practice uh, also shows us is how, you know, as social beings, how, we, we, how much we are, are dependent on or make us dependent on what other people think of us. I mean, we can easily say, yeah, but it's my reputation, it's not so important to me what other people uh, feel or think about me, but you, 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 you have to be pretty awakened uh, to be able to actually not be threatened by people because spreading rumors around you is not only that people have a very narrow image of you, but also it can affect your career. You can lose your job. So exploring this scenario is also exploring the, the topic of how much we still make us dependent on reputation and what other people think of us. And uh, we can we can feel the possible freedom and relief if actually we would care less.
So the, the, the Tonglen process here is the same. You start with your own responses, with your own reactivity. And as in the other scenarios, there's many different layers. Yeah, it's like many, many condition and condition, many wounds, many different responses. So it's not only just a rage, but there's all kinds of different movements. And, and when you explore them, you might notice the different layers yeah, of it. So if the rage maybe subside, then the grief comes forward or the helplessness or different layers of experience. And then uh, again, the, the walking in the shoes of the person who spread is spreading rumors. So maybe uh, we, we have not um, experienced uh, really like a, a, a slandering, a mobbing in, in work, maybe you have, uh, but probably we all have experienced that sting when someone comments on Facebook or you get into a stupid discussion online and then people say something hurtful, yeah? So it's not big, big dramas, but that, that's like, the, situa the situation where we can get a flavor uh, of that and we can observe uh, what does that do with us yeah. or how much we enjoy when there's a lot of likes and positive co comments yeah so that really shows our, our our addiction to to the feedback of other people and it's very natural as social beings we are depending on each other so it's really like a survival instinct of, our, for, of us to belong to the group. Because uh, there were times if we were excluded from the group, group we would die. And, and that's still in us. So it's, ver it's very deep for humans. So the, the giving here is then praise his or her abilities. Yeah? So that doesn't necessarily mean that you, you kind of write the praise that person, but internally, so you give. So you give that person who is slandering you the qualities of admiration, of being loved, of being accepted. So you share that with that person. And of course, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, a person who is really resting in, in, in himself or herself wouldn't spread rumors about another person. Um, this, uh, this investigation also helps us to become more mindful, um, um, more aware of the movement of slandering within us. And uh, with time, we just, start, we just start to stop to do it. Because it's like, I mean, that's when you take poison into your mouth and you start to you start to uh, feel it, you start to notice it. You kind of lose interest in talking badly about people. You know, the Buddha says, talking badly about people is, uh, is like taking a, 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 a burning piece of wood and burning your hand and then throwing it at, at another person. So you actually harm and hurt yourself when you talk badly about others. And from a karmic point of view, you create causes for other people talking badly about you. And it's such a widespread uh, habit in teams, in working places. I mean, that's, there's teams, and it, of course, these are horrible teams. It's very 
horrible to be in a team like that, where, is it, where it is a kind of habit for a value almost to talk behind the back of people. That's the best way to destroy a team, to destroy a community. And we are doing it. And why? You know, what is happening there? Why, why do we enjoy to talk badly about someone else? You know, it's like this puffing ourselves up and feeling good about ourselves for a short term, making a separation between us, the good ones, and the bad ones over there. So we become curious about this, uh, this, this habit. We start to understand where it comes from. And then when we see it in other people, we understand that it comes from pain. So uh, when we go through this process, um, opening to, the, to our pain, opening to the pain of the, the person who is doing the slandering, taking all that in, and then widening out the circle, you know, opening from a particular to the general, so we are connecting with all the people who are right now slandered who, and who are maybe slandered in, in, a, in, a, in a much wider scale than, than our little negative comment on Facebook. Uh, so really people whose livelihood is destroyed. Yeah, so we connect with that. And we open to that pain. And then we breathe out what is needed. We breathe out relief. We love, kindness, compassion. So what uh, an insight which might arise in this process And it's put by Ken McLeod like this. Bit by bit, you see that there is nothing in you to be attacked, slandered, or victimized. And nothing to be praised, respected, or idolized. You see that you are not your reputation. You don't own it. It does not belong to you. It is not you and it is not yours. It is a collection of thoughts and feelings in the minds of others about what you have done, what they have heard you have done and what they think you have done. Something in you lets go. You realize that you cannot control the world Yeah. So that's then how the practice of Tonglen can lead us into a taste of no self. You know, we start to see, hey, what is it actually what I try to protect here? What is it actually what I'm afraid of to lose when my reputation is damaged? And when we explore that, then we start to see, hey, that's a mental image. I'm trying to protect a mental image. And the confusion that there is a I, a separate me here, which I need to protect, uh, becomes obvious. Because you can't find that I, that me.
So, and then if that relaxation around that happens, the realization that what other people think of us doesn't change who we are because we are much more than our feelings and thoughts and our personality. So the, the, the self, the capital letter self, uh, is, is un, untouchable. It's not affected by what other people think about you, and it's also not affected what you think about yourself. It's bigger. So when you when you start to relax, this attempt to protect something which does not even exist, something which is just made up, then you start to feel the possibility of freedom. You start to feel, ah, I can more, I can be more free here. So if I can hear, if I can be free, a little bit more free here, a little bit more independent, a little bit more resting in who, I'm, who, I, who I am beyond stories. And then you start to feel the possibility that that freedom can be increased. And maybe the compass could be to actually come to a place where you are completely transparent. And when praise comes, it just goes through because there's nobody here. And when criticism comes, it just goes through. So I'm not saying that is, uh, you know, something we can uh, jump into. Uh, so, but uh, it can be, it can, one can start to sense a possibility and, and one can, understand the stories of masters in our tradition who have freed themselves what is called the eight worldly dharmas yeah and and four of them four of the eight worldly dharmas are actually around this topic so that, that shows how how uh, how deeply ingrained that is and you know i've read somewhere that that's probably the last thing which we can deeply relax because it's so difficult. So even if you are a renounced yogi, you might still worry about that people know that you are not uh, that you are an advanced yogi. Yeah? So it's very deep. So it's important to be authentic and honest uh, with with uh, with how you really respond to criticism and praise you know not not trying to pretend not trying to gloss over and then enjoy when you feel there's a bit more lightness in it you know, through the years a bit more easygoing a, a, a bit more carefree being So uh, at the end of his commentary to the first 14th, uh, um, Ken McLeod uh, uh, writes about what I just said, that it is easy to kind of try to gloss over or to lie to yourself or to lie to others. Uh, it doesn't matter what other people think. I don't care. And if people say that, most, most of the time they just lie to themselves. Not always. I mean, it's definitely possible to uh, become more free in that sense. Yeah? So I'm not saying when you have an experience like that, criticism and praise is just 
moving through without affecting you a lot, that could be a valid experience. I mean, that's not, uh, I'm not saying uh, you are necessarily lying to yourself. Uh, so it's also important to celebrate and appreciate when you know, when you, when you experience more space, at least compared to 10 years ago. So he says, Ken McLeod, many people just pay lip service to these instructions. They retreat into an idolized idealization of what it means to be a bodhisattva. They use the behavioral codes to mask their own anger and hurt and do not, and do not let themselves feel the intensity of their own pain, let alone the pain of the world. That is understandable. It is often unthinkable, frightening to experience what goes inside of you. If you wish to be free, however, you have no choice. So this uh, using behavioral codes to mask your own feelings, this is really a huge trap in the Tibetan tradition. It's like fake Buddhist smile, yeah. And, and faking, faking so much that you actually gloss over your own experience because you can't stand to be a person who slanders. You can't stand to realize, hey, this is what I'm doing. So when we, uh, when we um, move in, in Buddhist groups, there is that danger yeah, that we pay lip service to these instructions, we learn the codes, but inside it is boiling. Inside, I, I mean, it's not the case that if you have ever wor been working in, in a Buddhist center, that people are nicer there, not really. Yeah, and uh, you you notice uh, uh, bad backstabbing and uh, talking. I mean, I have experienced a, a lot in my in my case yeah. in Buddhist centers. People talking badly about me and not addressing the the point or the criticism openly. And so that's the danger when we have this, this ideals and we try to fake, you know, we try to put uh, the, the, the behavioral code within the Buddhist tradition you know, as something we can put on the surface and uh, uh, hiding behind. And uh, and and missing the opportunity to get to know ourselves and to be ruthlessly honest, at least with ourselves. Is there any comment or question? Something to, you want to add? I've got a question. Yes. I, I understand the, these teachings and, and my question is about um, let's say specific people, and actually just thinking about what I shared yesterday, if there are people that kind of repeatedly do this, then would the idea be to just compete, repeatedly do this practice for them or to create boundaries and just spend less time? Like, I'm curious if you could speak to that or just keep practicing taking it and then giving back. <laughs> Yeah, there's no like 
general answer to this question. Every situation is different and um, definitely continue to practice. So that's, of course, that's uh, always a good direction. Yeah, so what we, we never can give too much loving kindness and uh, yeah, so, but uh, then uh, to allow a response and healthy response to emerge, that's challenging. Yeah? So um, the, the suggestion here of Ken McLeod is that if you do the practice, so you, you, uh, you work through the layers of the experience, you connect with your heart, that from that, uh, uh, a healthy response will grow. Yeah? Um, But that's yeah, that that's something you know nobody can can figure out for ourselves. It's like uh, and and the healthy response uh, to a situation can be to kick an ass, but you do it you do it not from from violence. You do you don't do it with hatred. You don't do it to hurt. But you know sometimes we need to be really firm. Yeah. Is so also with the thought that if you give another person the space to continue to abuse you or harm you or slander you, you give that person the space to create suffering for himself. Yeah. So putting a boundary and saying no, uh, which we often avoid, not because um, it's a bad thing to do, but just because we're afraid to speak up, yeah, and uh, to 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 take our seat and to take our space. So we are just chickens, and we we close it in into a kind of spiritual practice, yeah. Um, and from outside, it looks even, and me maybe in, even in our own story about this, it, 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 we tell the story. Oh, I'm so patient and. And uh, I'm so compassionate and uh, I allow this person to do, but it's just fear. It's just fear of expressing. It's just fear of coming out and uh, taking your seat and uh, 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 honoring your limits and your boundaries. And, uh, you know, that, so the response to it can, can, can uh, come and can, can be firm, can be, it can be can be aggressive um, and uh, the practice uh, which we do in this situation for sure would will will help that if aggression in some form is necessary that that aggression is not as mean as it could be so if it if it if it's already a little less mean, that's a lot. There's still some meanness in it, but I think for many of us, it's more important to um, to uh, to explore that side and making mistakes instead of swallowing the aggressive side and not experimenting and not making that kind of mistake because we are afraid to make that mistake. Yes, we, we will make that mistake that there is a bit of self-righteousness or reactivity still in, but I think uh, for most of us, maybe not all of us may you know if we already have very much cultivated the capacity to say no, to put boundaries, to give feedback to people. So then maybe we don't need to train that, but I think many people who come to Buddhist centers, at least in my experience, they are rather, they are more people who maybe need to learn more the boundary setting, no saying, a, a kind of healthy relationship to aggression. Yeah. And not using the, the teachings on uh, non-aggression uh, to actually bypass a necessary spiritual a necessary psychological step. I mean, you can, you can leave your thought, 
by your side and not using it when you are sure that you can use it. So if you leave your thought of aggression by the side because you have never wielded it and you're afraid of it, that's not practicing. That's just being the nice girl and nice girl you grew up into your, in, in your original family. It's not practicing. So, but if you can use your thought, and if you're not afraid of the thought, then you can leave it by your side and not using it. It's a big difference. And then as beginners, when we, when we pick up the thought, we will cut ourselves and others. Okay. But there is, there is that risk. But I think the risk is bigger not to learn how to use the thought. The thought. Yeah. Stefan, um, is there an element, or could you say a bit more about that? Um, what, how is what you've just described also a, an act of compassion for the other person? Mm. I mean, is that part of it too? I mean, we, we have to take care of ourselves and yeah. experiment. Yeah. There's also mm -hmm. compassion for the other person, I think. But yeah, so one example is if you are in a codependent re uh, relationship to, a, uh, uh, to, to, to an addict, then uh, the, the thought, like putting boundaries, uh, in like saying, I'm, I'm going to leave you if you continue, or you know, something like that, um, that is actually more compassionate than being just tolerant and loving and you know and and taking care and uh, uh, so so that's what i meant when i said uh, when when we allow other people to step over our boundaries we create a condition for them to create negative energy for themselves which leads which will lead to suffering yeah. And it's difficult, of course. It, I, I can you know I, it's it's easy to talk about it, but in in the situation itself, there there is the there of course there is a lot of doubts. So what's what is actually the the right thing to do? How, how what's the most beneficial way to respond to the situation? Not only for myself, but for the whole situation, and with that for whole humanity. It's difficult, but the the assumption in the in the Mayana teachings is that somewhere in our heart, somewhere in our guts, something already knows. And in our in our practice, we we uh, we, we 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 learn to to listen to that, or we learn to be in contact with that uh, intuition. And and one reason, uh, one way to check is. Um, now, if it if your action was very much coming from the reactive self, then the next day or a week after, you will regret that action. You will feel ah, that was not that was not the the most kind thing I could have done in this situation. Whereas, if it comes from a deeper place, then that kind of thoughts will not appear because it, it just something in you knows this was right to put this boundary uh, so in other words you don't create karma it's it's closed you, you don't feel like you need to go back and fix and uh, so that's a sign that there's karma if you want to go back and fix, there's, there's something, so, there's something left over, is being carried in your mind stream. 
Whereas if it's a if it's a, a an act which comes from the heart, even if it appears as aggression, there's no karma. I, I mean, there's no negative karma. There's positive karma. And it's always mixed for us, of course. We can only try to do our best and fail, make mistakes and learn. Yes, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate that you continue to show up. And uh, next month we will meet again, uh, continue yeah, with, uh, with the uh, other scenarios. And let's uh, share the positive energy of this meeting with ourselves, each one in this group. So may we awaken to our potential and may everyone else awaken. And we can also share the merit or the positive energy with the activities of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Lama Sopa Rinpoche, the activities of the center in New York. And then maybe you want to specifically send some positive energy to people who have slandered you and people who have attacked you and hurt you, took your head off. So may all these people awaken to their true nature. Okay. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Take Stephan. care. Thank, Thank you. Stephan. So wonderful. Thank you, Stefan.